And joining us now on the debate, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Joshua Green, professor of psychology at Harvard University. In Sudbury, Ontario, Michael Persinger, professor of psychology at Laurentian University. And joining us here in studio, Alan D. Gold, former head of the Canadian Criminal Law Association. And Julian Goger, forensic psychiatrist at Toronto Western Hospital. Uh, it's good to, first of all, see you again, who I haven't seen in so many years. So welcome back to the program. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Joshua, welcome back to the program. You've been here. And Dr. Persinger, my goodness gracious, you and I uh, had a nice time in your, I don't know what you, what do you want to call that place where I was 15 years ago looking uh, for God? That was the uh, consciousness chamber. The consciousness chamber. I remember That's it as correct. if it were yesterday. I didn't <laughs> find God, but I did see a lot of football players that day. And I don't know what that says about my, my views on football and religion, but we'll leave that for now. <laughs> Let me set this up by saying we, uh, we regularly look at uh, advances in brain science on this program. And tonight we're going to take a look at the connection between brain science and the law. And I don't mind saying right off the top that the inspiration, Michael, for this program was your letter to the National Post talking about this very issue. And to that end, our, our producer Hillary Clark saw it, and to that end, uh, Michael, why don't we start by bringing up an excerpt of um, Michael Persinger's letter, because here's what got us started. Behavior is determined by brain activity, and very aberrant behavior is determined by extreme disruptions in these activities that we can now measure directly with brain imaging. There have been, and there always will be, individuals, such as Russell Williams, because moral decision-making and empathy for others requires specific brain patterns that can be disrupted by multiple causes. Canadian law will be forced very soon to accommodate the fact that there is no absolute free will. This opens up just a wonderful debate to have, and uh, I'm, I'm going to start with you, Michael Persinger. When we talk about neuroscience, particularly brain imaging, PET scanning, that kind of thing that you talk about in terms of measuring the brain, what are you actually looking to measure? Well, basically, modern neuroscience says that all experiences, all behavior, including the experiences of love and bonding and affection, even understanding the difference between a memory and a fantasy is tied to brain activity. And the more we understand the specifics of brain activity, the more we can predict specific kinds of behavior. Now, that's a very important concept because that means that ultimately, if we understand the mechanisms, we can control it. I mean, classic example, of course, the experiment is the most powerful tool we have. And in our laboratory here, for something as relatively significant as a sensed presence or feeling you're detached from your body, which we can first understand by looking at brain activity, by reconstructing those patterns, we can induce it experimentally. So if we can do that with relatively, you know, very powerful kinds of experiences personally, can we begin to understand how to predict and perhaps control some of the more extreme behaviors that put individuals in the population at risk? Okay, Joshua Green, you want to pick up on that and talk about what you would be most particularly interested in measuring? Well, uh, I actually think that uh, it, it's important to sort of get clear conceptually about what we're, we're arguing about or talking about uh, b before we even talk about specific results, because there's, there's a lot going on in this issue and there's a lot going on in that, in that excerpt from the letter. Uh, there are questions about the facts. What is the universe like? What is, what is human decision making like in the most general sense? And then there are specific questions about what parts of the brain are involved in what kinds of decision making. And then there are questions about morally or legally what follows from those facts. And in a sense, this is a very old debate. Uh, philosophers uh, long ago considered the possibility that the universe was just a big physical machine. And some people concluded from that, uh, said, if that's true, then there is no free will. In a certain sense, perhaps no one's really responsible for what they do. And so that's a very old idea. Uh, neuroscience is providing more details about the mechanisms of, of thought and action and, and, and behavior, uh, and, some, and, and, and perhaps just seeing the mechanisms in a more detailed way breathes new life into that old idea that human behavior is ultimately determined in a mechanistic kind of way. Or perhaps there are specific details that have where, where it's not just the fact that there are details, but the specifics of the details that matter. And then once you've got all the facts on the table, science doesn't answer the question. Uh, you have to ask yourself, OK, suppose that human behavior is completely mechanistic. Suppose that it's caused in this way rather than that way. What follows from that? Uh, so I, I, I well, not to take up too, too much time, uh, I'll just, I'll just leave, leave, leave that That's framework That's a good spot to leave table. it, yes, Josh, because you, you, you have to trust me. There will be follow-up questions. You don't have to say everything in the first answer. So <laughs> you're going to leave a little bit on the okay. table. That's Good. All right. Well, uh, Julian Goger, talk to us about this then. Do you think neuroscience can really look inside the brain and tell us something about how people may behave? Absolutely. 
we at the Toronto Western Hospital have a neuropsychiatry lab and the comments made by Dr. Persinga about his consciousness lab are no different from the lab that we have at the Toronto Western Hospital where we monitor people's brain wave patterns throughout their sleep. And in fact, very recently, a, a very fascinating case of a gentleman who was accused of having sexual intercourse with a woman claimed that he was in a state of sleep. It's the lab that actually showed that this individual was in the throes of a sleepwalking episode in the lab. What better window do we have into the mind than the electrical activity being measured in a lab? So science confirmed his assertion. Science confirmed his assertion, and we were able to actually present this evidence at court, and this gentleman was found not guilty of the crime. But what are we looking at here? Are we just looking at neuroscience, or are we looking at the application of neuroscientific principles in helping the courts understand who is dangerous? Well, let me pick up on that and go to you on that, because you've got, what, you're 30 years in, in the courts? Uh, something like that, Something yes. like that, okay. Well, so this, is a, this is a fascinating debate, and, and I think I could tell you this, that your, listener, your, your, your viewers should know, this is one of the hot topics in the legal literature. Uh, gallons and gallons of printer's ink are being used as we speak to write articles on this topic. Some I've read by Professor Green, as a matter of fact. Um, the problem is this. I, I can talk about it as a defense lawyer, and I can talk about it as a citizen. As a defense lawyer, I'm obviously delighted in anything that would help uh, my clients in the sense of mitigating their responsibility and perhaps securing an acquittal. As a, as a citizen, I can stand back and I can tell you that, as, uh, as Professor Green said, this in fact is a very old debate. Hundred, a couple hundred years ago, the law was faced, uh, came to a fork in the road and said, who do we let off as insane? That was the terminology. And the law said, some people claim they can't control themselves. And that's a topic uh, that is relevant to this issue. And the law said, but we have a problem. We can't tell the difference between people who can't control their impulses and those who won't control their impulses. So the law refused to recognize that type of principle as a defense. But the suggestion here is maybe now the, we can. The, well, and this is why I say this is why this is an old debate in new, this is old wine in new bottles. In new bottles, okay. okay? And I can tell you in the legal literature, this is something the law, the criminal law is going to be confronting very, very much in the, in the coming years. But in fairness, I, I, and, and I, I have the highest respect for Dr. Persinger, in fact, he probably doesn't remember, years ago I approached him uh, to be an expert witness in a case. Indeed, I do remember. Okay, <laughs> and, but I, I think Dr. <clears throat> Persinger, and I, I say this, he has one view. From the literature, I know there is an equal and opposite view who feel that, that these pretty pictures of the brain in action are overstating uh, their importance and that the law really does not need to pay this much, pay much attention to this right now. It well, hasn't reached out. the stage where it can really help. Michael Person, you want to pick up on that? I would like to. Well, first of all, uh, in terms of looking at uh, uh, neuroscience and imaging, uh, you're right, we're looking at sort of general behaviors, but if you take an example historically, for example, the Whitman case, the individual who shot several people from a university tower, and you find that in his brain there was a clear anomaly. In fact, if you actually take the time to look at the postmortem data and some of the pathological data, you'll find that extreme behaviors, particularly aggressive behaviors to the person or to themselves, are always associated with very, very extreme kinds of neurochemistry. Uh, for example, the, the, the serotonin pathways, or, for example, in, in the actual structure itself. So the critical thing is we don't have the precision now, but if you can take somebody into a laboratory and discern if indeed they are prejudicial or they're aggressive based upon some clear activity within the brain, that's a new technology. I would say that this, may, this, is, uh, this is a new wine, a new kind of bottle, because now we'll be able to predict. I mean, if we have these tools that allow us to understand what a person will do in terms of aggressive behaviors, we will now be in a situation we will be obliged to do something about it. For example, as a, as a clinical psychologist and some of my colleagues as well here would do the same thing. If you suspect a person is going to kill themselves, you have a legal obligation to pull a Form 1 to make sure they don't. So if you have the technology, the sophisticated measurement, that knowing someone's going to kill somebody, with great probability, then that changes responsibility not only professionally but also legally.
Hmm. Okay, Joshua, do you think we're at the point yet where, I, I, I hate to torture this metaphor a little more, I know you, you're the guy who suggested off the top this may not be that new a debate, but Michael Persinger seems to think this is new wine in new bottles. Do you? Well, uh, I, I think that it's, it's, it's kind of a mix. Uh, so, I, so, so M Michael pointed out that neuroscience may allow us to make predictions about who is likely to be committing crimes in the future and who isn't. Well, making predictions is not new. I mean, you can look at a number of social, socioeconomic factors and, 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 and personality factors that you can measure in low-tech ways and make certainly much, much better than chance predictions about who's likely to be committing crimes and who's not. Um, but for the most part, we don't say, maybe we should, but for the most part, we don't say, if you belong, if you're a member of a group that we can say, <clears throat> based on sort of more traditional social science kind of data are more likely to be committing crimes that you're not responsible for the crimes that you commit. Some people say that, maybe we should say that, but that's not, that's not the dominant response. In the same way, you might say, well, we could learn things about the brain that would give us some predictive power, but that doesn't really get to the heart of the matter about responsibility. Nevertheless, I think people do think that there's something special about neuroscience, and I think it really comes down to the fact that most people are, in some sense, dualists. That is, they think of the brain as a physical system that's distinct from the self, that's distinct from the agent, the person's mind or the person's soul. And if you think like that, then neuroscience really does seem to have this special status because the idea is that neuroscience can tell us the difference between a broken brain and a guilty mind. But if, if it turns out, as most neuroscientists believe, and a lot of philosophers have believed for a long time, that the self, that the soul, that the mind, whatever you want to call it, is just a physical system understood intuitively from the inside, then that line breaks down. So we have to ask ourselves, yes, we have these new neuroscientific tools, and they allow us to see things that we didn't see before. But to answer the questions we want to answer, we have to know what we're looking for. Okay. What is the Ju magic line? If, uh, all right, let me, let me follow up with Julian on that. Are, are you able then yet to tell us the difference between who is sick and who is bad? The question is an interesting question because I find myself standing at a chasm with a bridge leading across. But can we cross that bridge, the rickety bridge? And is neuroscience going to give us the strength to say that I have confidence that I can cross that bridge? Mm -hmm. And the bridge that I look at is the connection between science and human responsibility in a social sense or moral responsibility. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to connect the brain to a social construct responsibility. I can say that yes, in a specific individual, the brain would act as a modulator between internal emotions and external interactions and stimuli, but how do you translate that information to a social construct that can be applicable to the law? Got an answer for that yet? Well, we do. One answer would be, and I think as Josh pointed out, was yes, the brain can be hurt, the brain can be damaged, but how damaged must a brain be before that person's moral compass is lost? And that's something that's you, the threshold that we stand at. And you, can you answer that question yet? We can't, and it depends on the legal question being asked. Are we being asked a question about a responsibility or the responsibility a person has for an event, or is the question being posed that the person has now been found guilty of a crime? To what degree should we take into consideration his brain pathology right. in sentencing the individual? I'm going to go to Alan on that because uh, I want you to get us back into the courtroom here. The, the couple of cases I want to bring to our viewers' attention. In the United States, we know that uh, lawyers, attorneys, are already trying to get courts to accept MRIs as a new kind of you know, brain-based lie detector, if you like. In India a couple of years ago, a woman was apparently convicted of murder due in part to brain scan evidence. Are we seeing anything the likes of this in Canadian courtrooms yet? Not yet. And, and bear in mind, in the United States, this is very much in the context of the death penalty debate, whether a person should be put to death or locked up for the rest of their life. Canadian criminal law, uh, there, are there are going to be several fronts in which this is going to be uh, battled out, as it were. First of all, uh, criminal law presupposes free will. Um, this area of research and its supporters, uh, as has already been suggested, um, 
don't accept that. Uh, in other words, everything we do is, is determined. Uh, we don't really have choices. The appearance of free will is just, uh, it's just a kind of a false uh, a consciousness that the brain develops. We have a sense of it, but it's not really, we really don't have free will. That's one battlefield. The other battlefield is the criminal law has to be concerned about battle of experts because when Dr. Persinger comes to court and gives this evidence, with the greatest respect, I know I'm going, from the literature, I know there are people that believe otherwise and I will be able to find an expert that will come to court and, and say otherwise. So you're going to have a battle of the experts mm -hmm. in a criminal court. Uh, these are the types of issues. That, so our, the criminal law's line has always been this. If you know what you're doing, you're responsible. Doesn't matter whether you could or couldn't help yourself because we can't tell whether that's bogus or not. So if you know you're killing a child, it doesn't matter because you think God told you to do it you're going to be held responsible. If you think you're killing the devil, then you're going to be held to be insane. That's the line the criminal law has always drawn. Michael wants equal time from Sudbury here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I agree with all my colleagues, but I think some critical factors here. One, it's important to realize that we've, been, we've known for science, in terms of neuroscience, have known for some time that if you stimulate certain areas of the brain, you can get a, a muscle movement or a motor movement. If you stimulate other areas of the brain, the person would ask the question, why did you move your hand? They'll say, I wanted to. In other words, they actually attribute the experience to themselves, that somehow they had self-will or self-control, but we know it's a, an illusion of brain stimulation. And we also know that your ability to understand and, and feel what another person is doing, the theory of mind concepts, are also involved with specific brain structures. And I think what, the, what comes out here is there's a big difference between the science of what determines behavior and law is more consensual. And one of the problems I've always had over the years is that, uh, and I speak this often in the, in the, in the classroom, is that there's a, often a big difference between the science and the fact behind something, which was have great predictive value, and the consensual agreements and the social beliefs that people have that determine law. And I think one of the problems we're going to get into very soon uh, is, first of all, we know that uh, what determines behavior can be a single neuron. And that's uh, another big discovery in neuroscience, that the activity of a single neuron, whatever the random event that produced it, can actually direct a person's behavior. And that puts into the whole area of of again, probability and randomness, because when you talk about something like aggressive behavior, which is you're talking about murders in the order in Canada about what, five to 10 per 100,000 people, it's, it's not a very common phenomena. And we're, we're never gonna be able to predict what happens way out there in that fifth and sixth standard deviation, which is you know one person per million and one person per, per billion. Those individuals will always be there, and that's always been a problem for society. How do we deal with these? I mean, is there an explanation for why it happens? And the answer is, unless we have the precision of neuroscience to actually look at it from these new perspectives, we'll be stuck with a kind of a consensual background, a consensual past, which is almost quasi-religious in many cases. Okay, let me follow up on that with Josh. And Josh, but just before I put the question to you, I want to read something, uh, because not everybody is obviously uh, convinced by this new science. And this was in the, Stan the uh, Stanford Law Review back in April of this mm -hmm. year, and I'll read an excerpt from this paper. The familiar story is one of weak circumstantial evidence and impressive scientific findings. The combination of these elements may be a powerful prescription for injustice. Scientific evidence seems so compelling that it could sway even the most skeptical juror and convince him that the elements of a weak case are proved beyond a reasonable doubt. If, on the other hand, the defendant catches the court's sympathies, then the junk science may swing in the opposite direction and make a weak defense appear stronger. This story has played out before with phrenology, measuring the circumference of your head, the polygraph, and countless other forensic technologies that have since been discredited. Improper reliance on each of these untested and unreliable technologies has led to unjust outcomes. How much concern should we have that neuroscience is, you know, essentially the new snake oil of the 21st century? <laughs> <laughs> is that putting it too harshly? Anyway, Josh, you'll tell me. I, I I think that there, there are two ways to read that. One as, as, as caution uh, and, and, and the other as a reason for discarding it entirely. Dis uh, and uh, so snake oil implies that there's nothing to it, whereas caution would suggest that this is a new tool and it can be used properly or it can be abused. Um, and I would, I would take the latter interpretation, which is to say that it's not that neuroscience couldn't be relevant in some sense, but at the same, at the same time, uh, we have to be careful about people being overly swayed or overly impressed by things that are actually not relevant to the case. Um, but 
I actually think that what, what makes the, the, the neuroscience special is not anything having to do with the particulars of what neuroscience can find. As I said before, I think that it's really uh, just forcing people to confront the idea that yeah. human behavior is caused mechanically. And I think this, this gets us back to a question about, well, why do we punish people in the first place? Uh, and there are two basic reasons, two basic sets of reasons, I should say. One set of reasons or what you might call the forward-looking reasons or the utilitarian reasons. That is, we punish people in order to produce good effects. So when we punish someone, we hope that this will deter the, that person and other people from committing crimes in the future. We also might want to keep a dangerous person off the streets. Perhaps we think we can rehabilitate them. Those are all reasons for punishing people in order to produce some kind of good social result. Uh, the other reason is what's sometimes called retribution, and it's backwards-looking, which is to say that you did a horrible thing, and therefore you deserve to suffer because you did this horrible thing and did it with a culpable mental state. And this is where I think the neuroscience really can perhaps d d divide us and, 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 and sharpen our thinking about the law. Um, regardless of what neuroscience tells us or any science tells us, there will always be, I think, the legitimate rationale for punishment of trying to re reduce future crime and produce other benefits. And I don't think that's going to go away at all. But the idea of punishing somebody as an end in itself, as retribution, just giving people what they deserve, that's where I think the idea of mechanistic causes behind human behavior has some impact. I mean, if a hurricane destroys a village, we don't, we may be very upset about that. We might destroy the hurricane if we somehow could, but we don't think that the hurricane is bad or evil. It's just a physical, natural phenomenon. Yeah. And if we start to think of murderers as more like natural disasters, as terrible things that happen and things that we want to control and that we're willing to, 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 to control at some cost, but nevertheless not think of them as evil, uh, then that may undermine the motivation for retribution, even if it doesn't undermine the motivation for punishing as, as an instrument of, 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 of social welfare. No, I appreciate and that. I and, then, that and then, Alan, I can see somebody, one of your clients one day is going to go into court and say, look, it, I, I didn't mean to. My brain made me do it. Well, that, that's, a, that's exactly it. And, and I think this raises profound issues. I think Joshua's last point um, really has to make you pause and think because in a way it depersonalizes members of our society. Imagine accepting the idea that among us, all the people we see, they're not all people. Some of them are hurricanes. Some of them are inanimate objects that, that are d not really people. I mean, this is why this is such a fascinating debate, because it, it confronts the concept of free will. It, it confronts the idea that we are responsible for what we do. It's f absolutely fantastic legal issue. But the criminal law has to be practical. If, you're the, if someone stabs you, your pain is the same whether they are bad or they have some neuron that decided to fire. Well, they meant to or didn't. Uh, exactly. So, and, and the criminal law has to respect that. The other, only other point I'd like to make is that uh, I have read the literature, including Professor Green's material, on forward-looking and, and deterring people. I, I understand that this provides, there still remains a basis to lock people up. They're dangerous. I don't understand how you can still have deterrence because you can't deter neurons. If, you're, <laughs> if, if it's me uh, mechanistic and just uh, uh, causally uh, established, all the deterrence in the world isn't, isn't going to matter. So I have a little trouble that deterrence is still preserved. But having said that, and the flip side of it is, you know, because most things in life are double-sided, mm -hmm. imagine the idea that we can de de decide that someone is going to commit a murder. It's like Minority Report, the yes. movie with uh, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Yeah. Imagine deciding, we've, dis we've examined your brain. You're going to commit a murder in the next year. We're going to lock you up We're for life. Put you in jail ahead of time exactly. as so, a preventative move. So these are really troublesome Fancy. issues. Okay, uh, Julian, you want to follow Can, up? May I respond yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. Oh, one, one, one second, Josh. We'll get to Julian first and then you. Yes, trying to tie sure. in, just trying to tie in these points made by my colleagues. I am the expert called by Alan Gold or lawyers or the courts to explain how neuroscience can be applied. So we have two big questions here. What's its relevance and how can you apply it? And these are the two big questions that are coming out of this debate. <clears throat> the points made about prediction, that's applic application. Relevance is at what stage of the court proceedings are we going to use a neuroscientific scientific process? Now, from Dr. Persinger's point of view, 
I would agree that neuroscience has provided a tool to look into the brain. You can examine emotions, you can examine behavior, but can you actually apply these techniques? When you start losing a neuron, two neurons, a group of neurons, how many neurons should you lose before you say, now you meet that threshold that Alan's looking for? You know, you've asked a lot of great questions today. Are you gonna, are you, yeah. are you gonna answer that yes. question? Yes, the answer is, it's determined by the courts. The courts have defined it in legal terms, whether the person could appreciate the nature and quality of one's actions. So you as a forensic psychiatrist have to tie in. And neuroscience has not reached that stage yet. Okay, Josh. Yeah, I'd like to say something too, if oh, you don't mind. Josh and then Michael. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to clarify a few things. First, I mean, the, the, the philosophical idea that the universe is just a big machine, uh, it, it, it plays out, I think, somewhat differently than Alan's, com Alan's comments would suggest. The idea is not that some people are natural disasters, some people are like hurricanes, and then there's the rest of us normal people who are not physical systems, not purely physical systems. The idea is that everybody is like that. Now, yeah. it, it could turn out that neuroscience might show us the, the, the line between a guilty mind and a broken brain, but if, if, if what I'm saying is correct, and if what most neuroscientists believe is correct, there is no such, there is no such line, and we are all, in a sense, like hurricanes. Now, Alan said that we need to be practical um, and, and suggested that if human behavior is caused mechanistically, then you can't deter anybody. And I think that, 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 that there's a, a bit of a misunderstanding there, at least perhaps I didn't make myself clear. Uh, a mechanistic understanding of behavior, that is understanding behavior as being caused by physical processes in the brain and antecedent processes outside of the brain, uh, doesn't mean that behavior is not flexible. So you could, for example, you can train uh, a, a little snail not to, 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 to perform certain movements by shocking it. Um, and that doesn't mean that the, the, the snail can't be deterred, let's say, from, from, from doing the things that you don't want it to do, even though its, it's brain, its nervous system, may be a very straightforward, relatively speaking, physical machine. So actually, if we understand people as physical systems, albeit wonderfully complex and interesting physical systems, that doesn't mean that deterrence is impossible. And in fact, if we want to be practical, I think the thing to say is, uh, the practical thing to do is to recognize that uh, it makes sense to punish people in order to deter them from committing uh, future crimes. And that in fact, retribution, that is punishment as an end in itself, is actually punishment that by definition serves no purpose. So I, I don't think that, in a sense my view is very radical, in a sense my view is not very radical at all, which is to say that there's nothing wrong with holding people responsible for what they've done, uh, and there's no reason why we can't continue to have a criminal justice system that punishes people for breaking the law. Nevertheless, if we give up on the idea that people can be in some deep down metaphysical way evil, and that they deserve to be punished because they're evil, uh, that may have some important changes for the law, but it doesn't mean that everything goes out the window and that we have no sort of practical functioning legal system. Michael Persinger. Well, I think, I think uh, the critical thing, I think, is the language. And I think that's one of the reasons I mentioned the word phlogiston, in the sense that we're talking here about broken brains and broken minds. Really, I think the language can give us uh, inappropriate directions. Uh, phlogiston was an old concept before chemistry came along that things burned because there was something in it that made it burn. We realize that, that that's an archaic term that has no applic application once you realize how, how the, the nature of, uh, of chemistry works. And it's the same thing here. I mean, when you have a, a hypometabolic heart, you have a heart problem. A hypometabolic uh, pancreas, you, you may have diabetes or something equivalent. When you have a hypometabolic activity in the prefrontal regions of the brains in certain areas, then you're more likely to make decisions that are immoral or inappropriate or disastrous to other people. Uh, and I think that's the critical factor to realize that there is uh, the capacity for all of us potentially to do that. Now, in terms of the prediction, I think that's critical. We do this already. If a person has a propensity to be a pedophile, uh, we try to keep them away from the public for, for the public good. If a person, for example, has a risk factor that would make them risky to their platoon, we try to do something to keep them out of the platoon. If they have characteristics which make them very anxious to fly an airplane, we, we try to prevent that in some way. We don't put them in jail, but we are cognizant enough to realize that with the appropriate technology and the technology and the prediction that goes with it, I'm talking about real prediction now, not just you know, guesses, we can actually do something to help not only the person, but also to protect the public. Because what's the point of saying, you know, gee, gosh, somebody is killing somebody again and repeating it 
day after, you know, year after year and decade after decade and complaining about it and say everybody's evil, that doesn't help anything. But if we understand how it works, then we can predict and then we can do something about it. Gotcha. Alan, let me try this with you. If, if, if you were defending somebody who was accused of murder and it had been established by neuroscience that the alleged killer had some kind of lesion on his brain or something like that, are we in a position yet in this country where you can uh, put that into evidence and that the court would take that into consideration in sentencing? Um, in sentencing, yes. Um, in terms of criminal responsibility, the line is between bad and mad, and mad is defined in terms of what one appreciates. It's a cognitive test, uh, and that's the result of the historical experience that we're not able to tell who, who can and who can't control uh, their impulses. But having said that, as a defense lawyer, I'm delighted with anything that helps explain as I'm understanding the discussion, and, and I think it's a, a fantastic one, to the extent that it can be shown that stabbing someone is, is the equivalent of a Tourette syndrome, in other words, the physical act is the symptom of some brain disease, uh, th I think that's very important for a court to know. To what extent that should absolve a responsibility and to what extent the law can accurately determine who really is suffering from such a situation and who is feigning it, again, that, that's really, really important. In terms of sentencing, I have no trouble, and, and any court would look at the person's condition to the extent that they were less than fully functioning. Of course, it'll mitigate sentence. But the real hard issue is the line between mad and bad. Who, go, who is labeled a criminal and who is excused because they are not uh, normally responsible. And are you, Julian, concerned that the uh, the Alan Golds of this world, the defense lawyers, are going to be using, you know, brain scans in the way they use DNA today to try to, you know, either absolve clients or get smaller sentences or all of that kind of thing? They've been using it all these years, and I've been asked the same question. And the answer is, it's not just for sentencing. When we look at a case of homicide, there are three questions that are really, or four questions that are asked by the lawyer. The first question is, did the person have specific intent to make it a first degree murder when there's planning and deliberation? We have a second component, was there just plain intent, which would take it to the point of second degree murder. And then you have lack of intent, which would leave you with a manslaughter. And the fourth alternative would be a not criminally responsible defense based on a mental disease. Can brain scans help us with these four things? It can. <laughs> it can. And how it can is, if the brain scan can tell you there is a lesion in a critical area of the brain that might impact on impulsive behaviors, and Dr. Persinger actually raised that point about the frontal lobe of the brain, one can then say, in combination with the brain scan, other clinical factors might raise a doubt as to whether the individual could plan and deliberate or have purely impulsive behavior, which would then impact on a person's responsibility, at least from the intentionality. Hmm. That would translate from a scientific concept to a legal concept of intent. Now, that's a decision made by the courts, but the lawyer could use medical science, including neuroscience, to raise that doubt. Well, all of this, Josh, would suggest that those who believe in tougher sentences, tougher deterrence, uh, you know, get tough on crime in general, this is all bad news for them, isn't it? It all suggests that th there's a lot more going on here than just kind of, you know, small p political, let's go after the bad guys. Is that right? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that there, this is a, a, a clear win or a loss for any particular well-recognized political faction. And, 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 of course, a lot of the facts aren't in, but... Uh, it, you can you can look at it two different ways. You can say, well, uh, sure, this person has a brain lesion, this person doesn't. But at the end of the day, as 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 Michael pointed out initially, if somebody commits a crime, especially a very horrific horrific crime, it was caused by their brain, and therefore, by definition, in a sense, there has to be something wrong with their brain. And one way to look at that is to say. My goodness, in some sense, everybody's innocent. And that sounds like a very liberal thing to say. Another thing to say is, well, 
everybody can't be innocent. We have to be practical and so on and so forth. Or perhaps what we mean by having free will is not something that's, that's, that's or, or undermined by this. And so this doesn't tell us anything. And we can go on business as usual, punishing people to the extent that we intuitively or based on some kind of social calculation see fit. So I, I, I don't think that it, it, it clearly points in one direction or another. Um, my personal uh, view is, is that in some sense it is liberalizing, which is to say that the, when we, there's, a, there's a, a French proverb that says, to know all is to forgive all. Uh, that is, to, if you really understand all of the circumstances surrounding somebody's behavior, you may not think that behavior is good. You may want to try to predict it. You may want to try to prevent it. But you're not going to see it as having this uh, glow of, 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 of evil uh, are surrounding it. Understood. And forgive I, me. I, Let I me jump that in here. Forgive right. me, Josh, because we're literally down to two and a half minutes to go, and I want Michael sure. on this, and then Alan on one more thing. Go ahead, Michael. Well, I think uh, one of the real challenges is the fact that when we're talking about this thinking process, is that the uh, roughly 40 billion neurons that are in your cortex that are involved with this process, the actual energies are only in the order of about a billionth of a joule. I'm talking about the energy involved with action potentials and so forth. Most of that energy we see in scanning and imaging techniques are involved with the metabolism of keeping the cells going. So when we get down to those kinds of energies, we're now getting into the whole area of which, which is quantum and random variations and the idea of energy itself. And that's something that's going to be really interesting because what we re really don't understand is random events and how can random events result in this precipitation that will change a behavior that make a person homicidal. And that's really a great challenge. Uh, that's the one we're working on. Alan, let me ask you to wrap it up by asking what you think could be neuroscience's most substantial long-term impact on criminal law and policy. As, as a defense counsel, I love that French proverb. We use that okay. French proverb. We, we try and convince juries of the wisdom of that French proverb. At the same time, I appreciate the position of some citizens who might feel, remember a comedian made a whole career out of the joke, the devil made me do it? <laughs> Flip Wilson. Uh, Flip Wilson. Some citizens may feel this is a, a take on that, the lesion made me do it. I appreciate both sides. I, I think the criminal law is going to be struggling with this area of science for many years to come. That's where we'll leave it today. I want to thank everybody for a most fascinating discussion on a, uh, boy, is this a can of worms, eh? Boy, oh boy. <laughs> Joshua Green from the Moral Cognition Laboratory at Harvard University in Cambridge. Dr. Michael Persinger. Thank you. Good to see you again, sir. Uh, the neuroscientist from Laurentian University in Sudbury. We appreciate both of your contributions on the line today from your respective locations. You're very welcome. Dr. Julian Goger, the forensic psychiatrist at Toronto Western Hospital. Alan D. Gold, the criminal lawyer and past president of the Canadian Criminal Lawyers Association. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.